I, you know, it's funny. I'm raising money for our podcast company right now. And so I'm having to distill things into very small pitchable moments. And what I find myself telling people is if you want a better world, tell better stories. And I really believe that like the stories that we tell create the world that we live in. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy. With yours truly, Michael Kahan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A few words spring to mind about Sarah. Compassion, empathy, wisdom, kindness, courage, and my personal favorite, integrity. This is a beautiful conversation. Time flew by and I admire Sarah's openness and warmth. This is one of the highlights of the year and I just got engaged. A quote that springs to mind after having done this chat is be the change you want to see and Sarah dives into it and how she embodies it. It is great. I'm excited. I hope you are too. So let's get into it. Sarah Wayne Callies is an actor, writer and director. She's perhaps best known for starring in multiple hit television series, playing iconic roles such as Laurie Grimes in The Walking Dead, Dr. Sarah Tancredi in Prison Break, and Kate Bowman in Colony. Sarah recently launched her podcast, Prison Breaking, which she co-hosts with Paul Adelstein, who is a legend and been on this podcast. This is a rewatch podcast for Fox's Prison Break. This season, she's set to direct another episode of the CBS hit Fire Country and her first episode of NBC's The Irrational. Last year, she also starred in the ABC series The Company You Keep, And prior to that, she starred in the NBC series, Council of Dads. Her list of credits is way too long, so check it out in the episode notes. But she's been directing a whole bunch of wonderful shows. She's been in amazing movies and continuing her passion for storytelling. Sarah is the writer, director, and voice of the science fiction post-apocalyptic scripted podcast, Aftershock, whose second season recently launched on iHeartRadio. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot. And we chat about integrity, taking a break, happiness, prison break, and a new podcast, community, motivation, talking up, plus those in power, directing, advice from casting directors, plus plenty more. Before we get into this chat, I'd love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. We've had an incredible chat and it went really well. (laughs) Yeah, I think think that's it. Great. I was going to maybe start with directing, but actually this could be a funny place to start. Okay. You're going to have to fill in my gaps. Fantastic. But I heard a casting director kind of gave you game-changing advice. You'd just done a, I think you'd just come from theater and you were doing an on-screen audition. And Mm -hmm. she said to you, I don't know whether you can act on screen, but here's some homework. Can you tell me a little bit more about this experience? Yeah, that was my first summer in New York. So um, that's so close to true. It it, it basically is. So uh, (laughs) that one, well, I'll tell you, the audition before that yep. was for a casting director named Susan Shotmaker, who at the time was casting a Jack Nicholson movie. It might have been, uh, I can't remember, but it was a huge audition for me. I was coming out of uh, my master's in theater program. I had never worked on camera. And um, no, this is out of order. Well, anyway, since we started this, yeah. I went in. I had never read for Susan before. Uh, I had my sides. I sat down. She looked up from what she was doing, nodded once, looked back down at what she was doing. (laughs) I read the scene with the casting associate. Halfway through, she looked up a little bit like I was uh, like flowers that had been delivered unexpectedly or like a dog that had shown up in the room. You know, it was was a little bit of like, what are you (sighs) doing here? Huh? And I was like, God, I thought I was invited. And then I finished my read and she turns to the assistant. She goes, that wasn't bad. Turn the camera on this time. Let's do it again. (laughs) And 
I was like, oh, okay, um, sure. So we did it again. And it was a, it was a moment of realizing like, and I, I don't know Susan, I've never read from her for her before. She casts brilliant movies. But the first thought in my head was, this is a business where not everybody is nice to each other. Yeah. And that was instructive. Um, and the next thought was, you earn your way to people's attention. You don't, you know, everybody's super busy. You don't just get that attention because you exist, sweetheart. And it was super instructive. And part of what's interesting about casting is at least, especially then, this was 2002, it was one of the few places in the business of making film and television that was overwhelmingly female. There were more female casting directors, and I think probably still are, than male. And so my entry into this business, before I hit the world of producers and directors and writers who at that time were overwhelmingly male, was women. And women taking notice and going, hold on, let me give you a shot here. So the story that you're talking about was Meg Simon. And I finished grad school, I'll, I remember, because it was 420. It was April 20th. Um, in Colorado, the next week, we had a showcase in, uh, in New York. There was a girl in my class who had a friend who was a casting assistant for Meg Simon. So he came to the showcase and he brought me in. This, I believe, was my second audition in New York. My very first one was for an Xbox commercial. Oh, wow. This is my second audition. And it was for something they were doing on Fox that was like a bunch of female lawyers. I don't think it went very far. But they brought me in to read. And Meg said, you may be a good actor, but there's no way for me to tell because you're playing to a 2000 seat house and I'm right here. And I think the implication was stop acting in my face, <laughs> calm down. And she said, she said I'm going to give you five things to work on. Come back by the end of the summer. I'm not going to see you all summer. Come back at the end of the summer and I hope you've nailed them or I, might not ever see you again. I came back at the end of the summer and she cast me in Tarzan. Um, Crazy. And what I remember, it was all about scaling my performance down. And so what I started doing was running my audition sides on the subway. Oh, wow. And if I could do the scene, because there's like a margin of crazy on the New York City subway, <laughs> right? Like someone talking relatively quietly to themselves. This is before like Bluetooth headphones or anything, right? So yeah. there wasn't really an excuse to talk to yourself. But if you were like small time crazy, people would let you be. That's probably like the new normal there. Like if you're in Very possibly. That. Yeah. 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 And so if I could get away with not having the people around me go, what in the name of God is wrong with that girl who is <laughs> being so big and talking to herself? If they could just kind of go, well, that's normal, crazy. She's having a nice, mellow conversation with herself. Then I thought this is probably scaled appropriately for camera work instead of theater. That is such a, what made you think of doing it on the subway? Was it also you had a lot of time there or? Yeah. I lived in Brooklyn and I was bartending at 42nd at 9th at the West Bank Cafe. And there will be some people listening that go, the West Bank Cafe, wait a minute, was that when Larry was the manager there? Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> and was that when Steve Olson was running the place? Yes, it was. He, it was such an institution that I've been so many places in the world where I say West Bank Cafe and they're like, wait, wait, wait. That's when like wasn't Rusty one of, McGee would come in. And wasn't one of them, I don't know if it was Steve, I've forgotten his name, he hired you just because he wanted to be the first person to say that he hired you when you become... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, you're not a good bartender but i want to hire you just so you can tell people yes that is absolutely right and maybe three months ago i was walking uh on the beach with michael o'neill who is one of the actors who i got to know really well doing council dads together who's just a lovely human being nice. um and Michael and I started talking about living in New York and we'd lived in New York 20 years apart. And he was doing theater and had all these great stories about, you know, various incredible actors who you'd hear, oh, someone's, you know, so-and-so's doing a play downtown, you got to see it. And then he mentions, 
And then, you know, there was this little theater bar downstairs at the West Bank Cafe. And I was like, wait, the West, I worked at the West Bank. And he goes, did you, did Larry hire you? Yeah, and I was Larry, like, yeah, yeah. yes. And he goes, I'm seeing Larry next week in New York. They were friends oh, the whole time. 40 years ago, not 40 years ago, 20 years, no, 40 years ago in the seventies. Um, and they're still, they're still friends. It is that small a world. A classic. I, I have 10,000 questions. I want to scroll back to the subway. So <laughs> tell me, how did you kind of like figure out this technique? Cause there's a lot of time you would potentially be a little bit self-conscious, but you understand the, the craziness in New York on the subway. And you're like, this mm -hmm. is just probably the best way that I've got some time to myself. Well, I mean, a lot of it really was a necessity. Back then, they didn't email you sides. You went to pick them up. Oh, that's and they would be in a milk crate in a folder outside your agent's <laughs> office. Yeah. So by the time I made it 47 minutes from where I lived in Brooklyn to my agent's office, often there would be four hours before the audition and I wouldn't wow. have time because you know these are little parts right they're not like oh my god this is a huge role we're casting in you know the next Scorsese film it's we need somebody for three scenes to come do a thing yep. and we need it cast by tomorrow because the breakdown showed up this morning because it's not an important part um so part of it was that and part of it was knowing that it would force me to stop acting to the exit sign at the back of the orchestra. It was just the only way to do it. That's amazing. And you got two great pieces of advice from these two casting ladies. The first mm -hmm. one, it reminds me of a, a friend of mine. Oh, was it the second one? I've already forgotten the order, but you know, she's <laughs> saying that, you know, you can actually act. You're acting from more of a theater side. It reminds me of a story of my friend. He did this interview. He was 10 years too young for this like management stock. I don't even know what it was. And the guy was on his phone the entire time. And he was Oof. just nodding. He's like, yep, yep. And he was SMSing. He was doing the whole thing. And my friend's like, what am I doing here? And he still continued. He just pretended the guy wasn't there. It's a one-on-one -on -one interview. Yeah. And he couldn't believe it. And the guy got, gets up, shakes down, goes, that was the best interview you had all day. You'll, you'll get the job. But I would imagine it just, that story blows my mind. But also with you, Bananas. I know you said that you need to earn someone's attention. But to me, that would be really intimidating. You're going there to do your work and someone's not listening to you. You are there. You have the audition. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, listen, it is devastating. And I'm very, very conscious of that. You know, I don't do much in-person casting because the business has changed. But when I first started directing, I ran a couple sessions in person. And I do everything I can to give them my undivided attention because I know nice. even when somebody walks in and I know by the first two lines, this isn't the right role for you, not a talent issue, this is not the right role for you. I know that they, if you're a good actor, you put 10 to 20 hours of work into that audition. And I'm not going to shit all over that. Um, but you know, people get jaded and, and for all I know, that casting director was doing a favor to my agent who begged and said, please just see this girl. You don't even have to watch her. Just bring her in so that I can say I got her, you know, like you, you kind of never know yeah, the behind the scenes of it all. Yeah. And then the moment where... <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know, where she's like, okay, now you're worthy. I know this is my word. Now you're worthy. We will click the oh, record yeah. button. What was oh my God. that? I would also be quite nerve wracking then as well. Or do you like, I've got nothing to lose? No, I mean, you know, what's interesting is I was coming out of such a grad school mindset. I was like, you say jump, I say how high. Like I, I actually had no sense of my own kind of boundaries or worth because I'd never had a professional job, yeah. so to speak. And so you're sort of going, oh, I'm a beggar at the feast. I'll just let them, you know, like treat me however you want. I'm just grateful to be here. And in some ways that's part of being a beginner. But I think also, you know, there's a, th there's a thing where it takes you a minute to kind of claim a little bit more agency before you go sorry what <laughs> like okay okay but i don't know it, it yeah i don't know it's not ideal but i mean i part of me coming up i came up through a ringer and it wasn't necessarily fun but it's now very hard to rattle me 
It's very hard to put me off my game. It's very hard. I mean, I've had people scream in my face on a set and I'm just sitting there going, this isn't about me. This is about you. And I'm really sorry that you're hurting like this, but it takes a lot more than a temper tantrum to move me off of the work that I came here to do. So, you know, there's value to that. There is. And there's someone's done a lot of work on themselves. Doesn't matter who is someone screaming at you and going berserk, even to realize in that moment, first of all, it's threatening. But second of all, it's psychotic. And third of all, there's like, and third of all, I don't have the vocabulary <laughs> to explain all the other adjectives to go with, but for you to still be Bananas. you in that moment and go back to what you're doing, that is rare. That would throw off anyone. Where does that come from? Is that just a sense of knowing who you are and you understand people have their own issues and I it's mean, not about you? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think part of it, and not to be sort of too flippant with this, but part of it comes from just being a girl in Hollywood and like the number of people who have decided that they would get in my way for the cruel, uh, for the crime of not wanting to sleep with them. And I'm just like, nope. Nope, not today. It's not going to happen. You know, like, I mean, listen, I have watched men I work with fly into these extraordinary careers because they've built these enduring relationships and connections with men. And I'm like, right. Those men don't make those connections with me because either I can't go drinking with them after work because they're concerned that it's going to be, <clears throat> that it's going to be seen as untoward, you know, they're out of respect or, you know, maybe there's a bit of a, a in their relationship, they don't want to make somebody jealous, whatever it is. Um, or those men have been problematic towards me. And when someone calls and goes, hey, I was thinking of hiring Sarah, they just take that long pause that's the kiss of death, right? They just do the, <sighs> yeah. Oh, that's the Right. And so like, it's that easy to dismantle a woman's career. And there are times where it's a real head trip for me to look at the opportunities that some of the men I've worked with have had. And then now here's what's beautiful, because there's a beautiful part of this. Now I'm able to uh, mentor and bring up and partner with women in the business who now have either less pull than me and I can go, wait, 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 here, let me help. Let's, nice. let me bring up or women who are like, man, I had to fight like hell for this. Come with me. And so it is changing. That's um, but it's made me, <laughs> it's like, I feel like I put on a mask and cape at the beginning of every day. And I'm like, where are the women? Let's do this. Let's <laughs> produce together. Let's write together. Let's whatever we're doing. Collaborate. Yeah. 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 Entirely. Thank you for bringing that up. And I, once again, don't have the vocabulary to express how we'll say psychotic. That seems to be the, the right way of I'm putting it. <laughs> it's our theme. It's our theme. You know, a few people have spoken about it on this podcast and there's a few things. One, very grateful that people do because when you raise awareness of an issue, regardless of what the issue is, then, you know, we stop that issue and we rise above it. But also- yeah. Typically, we hear stories of where people even talk at, like, let's say, lower level. There are no low, lower levels. That's a bad way of saying it. But, you know, there's a fear of losing their job. They might never work mm -hmm. again. And, uh -huh. you know, you just spoke about that. You might not work again if someone just pauses. And that's ridiculous because that guy is sadistic. Oh, yeah. And I know that I think there was an example potentially with Fox. I don't fully know the story. You can go into it if you want. But I was just wondering, how do you do what you want to do when you've got all of this absolute bullshit, knowing that it's like not even you, you've got like predators and other bad adjectives around there. And, you know, you here, you love acting and now you're doing directing and writing and billion other things. You still want to do what you want to do. And then you've got all these other bullshit things that you haven't signed up for and they can really throw you about. And that's putting it lightly to still remain in your power. How do you, how have you been able to do it? I mean, allies, you know, and, and just to make sure that the numbers are clear, by and large, they outnumber the, the I want to say bad actors, but that sounds like a more literal term than I mean it, like that, yeah. 
there are the people and often on a set it's you know it's other women in hair makeup or wardrobe who were just like in those those moments right before you know the camera rolls if they see that something's going on they're just like do you do your work i got you you know like there's just those little moments or even you know crew members mm. who will be like hey that was silly let's move on they're awesome. like yeah man that was silly let's move <laughs> like on that. <laughs> um, because a crew has seen everything. Yeah. Crew have usually themselves been at some point treated in ways that they should never be treated. And, you know, they're, they're usually more silent, supportive people that, you know, you kind of build that sense of community and love around yourself. Um, so that every now and again, when, you know, when somebody gets spicy or vindictive, it's like, well, okay. We have a saying in my family. It was based on this book we read uh, to the kids years ago, but like squids will be squids. You know I what I mean? Really like, like that. Yeah. Squids. Squids will be squids. And I'm not going to say it doesn't, you know, there are times where I like go home and cry about it, you know, and I'm still working on letting go of some stuff for sure. But man, I've been lucky. Like the things I've been allowed to do, encouraged to do, mentored to do, supported to do are so much more beautiful than the like little tiny bullshit moments of insignificant people who have tried to stand in my way, you know? Yes. I, I'm very proud of you to stay in your power despite all of that. <laughs> it's very hard to... uh put put words into it because it's not easy and it's, it brings up challenges and traumas and things so it attacks who we are and for you to stand up and rise above it and talk about it is amazing and i also feel i know you've spoken about this that that's also partly why you've got into directing to create great sets not even yeah. just from the sexual bullshit just great sets where everyone yeah. can meet each other where they're at and this is sort of off topic but on on topic, I know that with The Walking Dead, that was a key point for you and some of your cast members was to create a great set. And I think that's, yeah. especially then, because that is still like, it's still happening quite a bit at that stage, especially of Walking Dead. I'm sure it's still happening now, but hopefully it's gotten mm -hmm. 10 billion times better. You know, <laughs> you could just do your thing. For example, The Walking Dead, you know, you're, you're probably close to number one on the call sheet. You can just do your thing, get your money and act. But no, you went up and beyond to create a set and as also yeah. the directing as well. I, you know, I really do think that we do better work when we create community. Um, yep. Because you're going to have days where you're like, I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't, for whatever reason, whatever I did yesterday that worked, it went home and I came to work and oh God. And those are the days where you really want to be able to like, you know, turn to your dolly grip or, turn to the makeup artist or turn to the caterer, or turn to your co-stars and be like, hey, hypothetically, if I was terrified right now and pretty sure I was going to fail, could you give me a hug or like run lines with me or just tell me it's going to be okay? I mean, those kinds of things I think are really, they make a material difference. And also Agreed. that feeling of love i walked into that set with frank darabont doing our first episode and frank directs like it's christmas morning you know i mean he was so excited by every shot wow. and so patient when things you know we, there were a couple of stunts that like took two days when they could have taken an hour but he was like nope we're gonna do this right and at least what I saw was somebody who led from a place of love and joy. And I was like, well, shit, if we can do that, we probably all should. Agreed. Isn't it crazy how it wasn't necessarily the norm? Like we can't speak to all the sets, but we hear, I've heard personally, and I'm scared to hear your take, <laughs> that there's so many sets that aren't like that. And for example, I'm not an actor by any means, but the thought of going to a set where, you know, even if you're doing a few lines, which is still great, you're a guest mm -hmm. actor doing a guest spot, you don't know anyone. And then you on this like terrible set for many reasons to bring out that creativity and also 
exam- amplify your performance when someone's just like, hey, the bathroom's over there. That changes. And we've had so mm-hmm. many guests say that it really can impact their performance. Obviously, they're professional and get into it, but just having a warm set and just saying hi Absolutely. to someone, it changes Absolutely. everything. And it probably makes the crew, it can, make up the, it can help the makeup people. I don't understand why it's like a new topic. It, it blows my mind. <laughs> I mean, to look, to be fair, the amount of pressure that is put on people on a set, it's really hard. It gets to everybody. It's gotten to me, you know, especially We're when you're human. directing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when you're like, I've got eight ounces of work to fit into a six ounce glass today. And, and then something happens like there's a rainstorm and everybody has to go to their trailers to get out of the lightning for two hours. And like... It, it, the studio doesn't care. I mean, look, they may care, but they're not going to give you an extra day. You know, like there's those kinds of things really can get to people. And I think for me, part of the paradigm shift that I'm trying to work with as I'm moving in the directing space is that this is a collaborative medium. And so in those moments to turn to the people around and the department heads and go, hey, friends, what's the way forward? Let's like best idea wins. Let's go. As opposed to what I think started as a kind of like patriarchal, I'm the boss perspective of like, okay, director, you better get us out of this one. And what really surprised me getting into directing was how much every department head was really willing, almost without exception, to pitch in. They just hadn't been asked. (laughs) You know, Ah. like there's something about, I think if you give people an opportunity to surprise you and surprise themselves, most of them are very, very game to rise up to that challenge. I think it's really nice as well. Like um, I do screenwriting and we'll we'll get into it maybe. And the idea, look, everyone works differently and there's no judgment towards someone else. But if someone, even if it was inverted commas, the makeup person or camera person, and they somehow saw a script and go, you know what, this line could be funnier. I would hear it. I'm not, mm-hmm. I understand that I'm one aspect in the world that I've created in my head. I know it works differently. Like I would love that. That's like why yeah. I'm doing this, the collaboration side and knowing that, yes. that it can always get better. I know there's time. And there's a lot of like limitations in some regard, but just the idea of listening to someone, if you've got the time and space and things are moving, Mm -hmm. that just feels so right. (laughs) And it's still, yeah. And I think it's moving more and more in that direction. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's worth kind of keeping in mind. Somebody told me this a few years ago and I thought it was interesting because it filters down, but basically the structure of Hollywood was a bunch of men returning from the first world war and importing the structure of the army. You have the general, you have the people underneath him, you have their departments and the department heads. And there was this very sort of militaristic chain of command about like, you don't question the person, person above them, above you, you, you know, like there was kind of rules to that sort of thing. And I think that's certainly one way to do it. But what we're starting to learn is that's not the only way to do it. Obviously you want organization, you want everyone to be accountable to somebody, but if we, if we soften that into a little bit more of a like, let's think of this as a team, you know, like you might be our kicker, you might play 60 seconds a game, but what do you need from us so that in those 60 seconds, <laughs> you get the ball through the, well, it's not a hoop. What is that? I'm not a football person, but yeah, the, the, the goal, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, oh, the goal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You you do the thing and, and maybe that's all you got to do. Maybe it's just those 60 seconds. Then you've got, you know, you've got the head coach and it's like, what does the head coach need? That's kind of what directing is, right? Like I'm the head coach. I'm there every play. I'm talking to people. I'm not on the field. I can't do the job of acting, but I, it's my job to sort of make sure that everybody's got what they need. And so I think if we think of it maybe slightly less like a military operation and a little bit more like a team Yes. That shifts our perspective into a place of recognizing there's there's not a hierarchy here. There's not a pecking order. There's a we've all got the same goal. And let's get to that goal together with love and respect for everybody. We can do that. 
I love that. And also like from, and there's no judgment towards the army and how they do it in terms of that's very much like very linear. This is how we do it. You yeah, cannot. No one's shooting at us. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, Everyone, everyone. I'm just saying in terms of it doesn't feel like that could be applied very well to a creative field when it feels like two different sides of the brain. And then even like questioning, mm, questioning mm-hmm. in that sense is not mm-hmm. allowed. Whereas mm-hmm. in creativity, it's all about questioning so you can get to the truth or to the right answer. So it's like mm-hmm. based on this conversation, it feels like the worst approach to go about a creative yeah. endeavor, like the worst possible. And I know there's many other factors and I'm ignorant in that For sense, sure. but yeah, that's that's my little rant. <laughs> I want to also <laughs> know it. from the um, the acting side, you know, you are... I don't know if it's a full transition, you're still acting, but it sounds like directing's mm. now more of a passion for you or is it equal or is it even hard to put a number on it? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I mean, I've, I've been writing more too and I've been podcasting and I, it really comes down to storytelling for me. Um, what's the best way to serve the story? You know, there are certain stories that like they don't need a 5'8 brunette in her 40s. Okay, well, do you need a director? Great, you know, there's... There's a place, um, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I'm raising money for our podcast company right now. And so I'm having to distill things into very small pitchable moments. And what I find myself telling people is if you want a better world, tell better stories. And I really believe that like the stories that we tell create the world that we live in. Yes, and that's a great tech. So if there's a story that I think will fall in fall under that kind of mission statement. What do you need? Maybe maybe this is a story with only black people. Great. Can I produce? Uh, can I just get on social media and brag about you? Like, what's the way? What's the way to get the story told so that we can change the world through that through that way? I love acting. And I, I just feel like I started to understand what I'm doing. So like, I want to keep acting because I feel like I just started, no, as an actor, I just feel like I started to learn like how to really do the job. Well, it'll be another 20 years before I figure out how to direct really as well as I want to do, but like, it takes a long time. Um, so I don't want to stop acting, but I also, I also don't want to have to make the choices that. I think a lot of women have to make when they get older, you know? I mean, I realized at one point in my career, I, it was actually, it was on the last show I did with, uh, with Milo of Intimili. We did this cool show for ABC last season. And um, I realized that almost, almost without exception, every woman I knew in her 60s who was still acting had a husband who was a breadwinner. That she was, despite shelves full of Emmys sometimes, despite extraordinary accomplishments, these women in their 60s were not able to make a living wage. They were, you know, being asked to audition for parts that were frankly beneath them. They were offered top of show when they should have been getting much more money. And I thought, I don't, I'm the breadwinner in my family. I was like, that's economically not an option for me. So creatively, how do I stay in this realm of on-camera storytelling that I love so much? And, and I think that's by having the flexibility to move between different disciplines. I love that. And it's, it goes to two things. One, like seeing a, you know, it's something you love, you love storytelling, but also like holistically being like, how can I also get the income for something that I love? And also it goes back to the quote that um, springs to mind is like, be the change you want to see. Like from a director and a writer, <laughs> you can create opportunities totally. not only for yourself, but for stories that you're interested in. And yes. so a lot of acting actors, and there's no judgment whatsoever. We're like, we can complain all the time. We want the roles and all of this stuff, which is, which is great in that sense. Totally. But you actually gone one step above to be able to, you know, make the change that has impacted you. I don't know if that's the right way of saying it. But, you know, you can actually do something about it through going into this pursuit of directing, which may I well, add? Um, yeah. No, please. I was just going to say it's scary. You've been doing acting for I don't know how many years, and then you go directing, which is a different skill set. Starting new, that could, okay, go on. 
Well, that's what I was going to say. I, I mean, you know, your podcast is called Funny and Failure. I was so scared directing my first episode. I mean, and like, and this second, is, yep. and third, and fourth, like, just because you go in going, I know that I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> That's and smart. so I am going to be relying on the people around me to cover my blind spots and uh, and on the best sets, that happens. You know, on the best set, you've got a DP who's going to go, can I make a suggestion? Let's put it here instead of here because this is going to be beautiful and this is going to be tricky. Oh, great. Well, amazing. On the best sets, you've got a script supervisor who goes, uh, "You're, I think you're missing a, a two shot in this thing set up with the, these two guys to cover this line. Oh, fuck, you're right. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but that doesn't always happen. And so I, I was shaking in my boots and was very much not able to stand in, in the strength of the person that I wanted to be. You know, I remember hiring Adam Beach um, to do an episode of, not like I hired him, I put his name forward for a role on Good Doctor because they, I noticed they hadn't had an indigenous actor and Adam's phenomenal and it was a role that was cool. And he shows up the first day on set and I was like, cool, 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 cool. Like this is a singular actor in his generation who has been directed by Oliver Stone and, you know, David Ayer, like all of these extraordinary people. And I was like, hi, <laughs> I'm going to try and... Uh, I'm going to try and own the position that I have been given directing this episode, but inwardly, I'm just thinking, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up. <laughs> and Adam was so kind and so patient um, and also like doesn't need a director. He's just too good an actor for that. But, you know, oh wow, it, it was just like, I'm sitting here working with one of the actors that I've admired for decades um, just abjectly terrified. <laughs> it's it's great of you to acknowledge it because sometimes when we're coming from fear or we're scared, we can try and sweep it under the rug. And for you to acknowledge it, and you know, you're also addressing it with this actor as well, and you know, you're owning it, and you're not meant to be good at anything the first time that you do it. And I know you probably have high expectations of yourself and what you've seen. You've been doing this for ages. How quickly have you kind of pushed that, not pushed it, have you worked through it to realize that it's okay? You are good at what you do. The, the biggest mistakes I have made as a director have been made precisely because I was afraid to voice that fear and afraid to ask for help and afraid to look weak. Um, and interestingly, like I'm about to direct my 10th episode, which is not of, much in the career of somebody of television. Yeah. Which um, show, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, I'm, I'm doing another episode of fire country oh, um, very for nice. CBS, yeah. which is such a loving and welcoming set. And I think we've had a few the irony, actors on it. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Max Theriot, Billy Burke, um, Jordan Calloway, Steph, I mean, Steph, Diane Farr, like yes, they're Diane wonderful. Farr. Yeah. They're all amazing. Um, but ironically, the more I do, the more I direct, the more comfortable I become with saying, does somebody have a better idea than this? Because I got to say, I'm not super inspired by this, but it's the best I've got in the moment. Yeah. And that's partly from watching really seasoned directors more closely and watching them turn to their DP and go, can you make this better than I'm doing? I'm not happy with this right now. And that's my fault. What, what do you have? And like that, I was not good at that because I was so afraid for people to say, she doesn't know what she's doing. And I, I've had to get much better at that. And now that I've done it a little longer, I think I'm getting closer. I think what you just said is a life skill. You know, whenever we move forward or even linear, or whatever the direction to the sideways, we all have this. We can all have it to different degrees. We can be scared to ask for help, scared to be mm -hmm. seen as inverted commas weak because it's not so much taught mm -hmm. in society. We're taught we have to be the person in charge has to show all the power. But by mm -hmm. putting your hand up and saying, you know what, I need a better outcome. And, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully you surrounded your, and it sounds like you have surrounded yourself with great people that can help you. 
do that. That is very hard to do. It's been very hard for me. It's yeah, been man. very hard for other people. It's just, it seems to be universal, but isn't it quite freeing? I know that there's still a, potentially a journey there for everyone, but quite freeing to be able to acknowledge that you're not actually meant to know everything. You meant Huge. to kind of like steer the ship. You've got people there that can help you. Has it been freeing or is it still a bit of like a push and tug? Mm-hmm. It's so much more freeing. It's so much more freeing. And and again, I keep finding that when people are asked, they've got gold in their suggestions. Mm. But so often they're told what to do, not asked what they would do. And it just feels like there's the potential to unlock a whole intellectual capital oh, I love that. treasure chest um, by by doing that agreed i i think it's so great and now from directing in terms of the imposter syndrome how is that <laughs> yeah. i label that i don't know if you sorry if you don't call it that no no totally because you know as I, as I said you know you've been doing acting for so long and you you know i know you said you're only feeling like um you're getting good now but you've been good for a long time and now you've been doing you know you've been doing it for a long time and then directing is mm-hmm. something that's quite new and a lot of people mm-hmm. can get scared and you know, no judgment because I do it all the time. You get scared starting something for the first first few times or whatever it is. I know you said you're nervous, but has that relationship been a bit better um, with yourself knowing that, you know, this is still a new endeavor? I mean, yes and no. The truth is that the audience, when they watch something, doesn't know or care how much exp- how much experience the director has. They want the show to be good. Yep. And so on the one hand... One of the things I love about directing on television is that there's, you know, you've got someone who's come in and done 400 episodes of television and they're brilliant or 200, whatever it works out in the course of a life. Or you've got me. We're still getting paid the same and we still have the same resources. But I, I mean, in some way, there's no excuse. You know what I mean? Like, there's no like, oh, well, she, you know, she did okay. She'll do better next time. It does. It really doesn't work that way um, because there's so much money at stake. And there's, you know, the game of creating something that advertisers are going to want to sell on, that studios rely on and shareholders like, you know, that, that, that bar is where it is. And it's not going to move just because... I haven't been doing it as long. And so I do still feel that pressure. Um, But yeah, I do. But what I, what I found, and again, it was, it was the few women in my life who had started directing from acting. What they kept saying to me is, you know, more than you think you do. You've been in 250 episodes of television as an actor you understand certain basics of how to treat people on a set, how to read a call sheet, when to look at an actor and go, I'm going to get three more takes out of her. And then she's going to be too tired or too wrung out emotionally to do work that she's happy with. So let's focus on getting what she can give us right now. And let's focus on something else later. Like those things, I did not come up through the camera department, you know, so if I explain a shot to a DP and they say, do you want a 50 or a 65? I'll say, I, I don't know. You go ahead and direct the photography. I'm going to direct the actors. I, you know, I want the shot to look like this. Um, so I need that collaboration from people. And there may come a time in my life where I've been doing it long enough that I can turn to a DP and go, hey, would you, you know, throw on a 65 and do this technical thing and that technical thing? Um, but, you know, by the same token, I just worked with a wonderful DP who on my first episode of Fire Country, Stuart Whalen, who often he doesn't pick the lenses. He lets the operators pick the lenses. He's like, I'm not the one holding the camera. I'm telling you the shot I want. You give me that shot. You, you architect it however you want. And his camera department loves working with him. I can see because why. Because he gives them agency. It's very interesting. This just springs to mind. It sounds like also from the directing side, but a lot of actors, in fact, every actor I've ever spoken to, they have a belief system at some part or it maybe continues the whole time that I'll never work again. And so, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd love you to speak to that, not only from the acting point, but also from the directing point, from what you're saying that if you do a bad job, 
based on all the other variables you're given, you might never work again. And that is quite scary. Not for those people. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying. I mean, yes, I think when you eat what you kill, the fear of starvation is real, right? And that's, uh, yeah, that's, that is present. Um, I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better at having faith that the next job will come, partly because I now know enough people who are doing amazing things who want to continue to work with me. Um, That's nice. Partly because, you know, like I'm working in the podcasting space where I can create something without needing a studio to green light it. Um, there's something hugely democratizing about that and really exciting. Mm, it's you. It's yours. Um, you know, honestly, the th this is becoming a therapy session. <sighs> honestly, the thing that I'm really working on is not the question of will I ever work again, but the so what. Like not identifying myself with my professional status or perceived success. Um, I love that. Because the strike and the pandemic were really interesting. And I was like, oh, I've been a working actor for about as long as I've wanted to be a working actor. And now I'm not. So not to sound dumb, but who am I? <laughs> That's the ultimate question. It was heavy. And I realized I, I way over identify myself as I'm an actor. I get to wake up every day and go to a set and have a place and know where I belong and the people I belong to and the story I'm telling. Absent that, I, you know, I, my head started to kind of not be in a great place. And so I'm working a little bit more on trying to figure out who I am absent my career. I think it's really interesting, especially from an acting point of view, because most actors, they work a certain amount of times in a year, but you're potentially working way less than you are than their days in the year. And mm -hmm. so we all can say, I'm an actor. And then when you're not acting, you're like, well, what am I? But I feel mm -hmm. like there, there were some really positive shifts, shifts for you in, those, in that timeline with you know, COVID and um, the strikes. But I also feel, and I think this is really interesting, and I feel like this would help you. You don't live in LA, you don't live in New York, you live in um, mm -hmm. in Canada and you've got a community there, I believe, and they mm -hmm. don't care that you're an, an actor whatsoever. And I feel like that really would don't. help you mentally. Can you tell me more about your lifestyle there? You know, it is helpful, although sometimes the reverse, like two of my closest friends are farmers. And every now and again, I'm like, what do I do for a living? I like digitally record numbers that translate into images that get flashed on screens. These guys plant crops and raise livestock and feed people. Like there, there are times where I look at the things that some of my friends do and I'm like, oh my God, did I just not grow up? Like, did, am I just playing make-believe and you know I do fundamentally think that storytelling is sacred but there are times when you know I was having dinner with them a couple of nights ago and they were like what what like what do you <laughs> you're talking about a funding a what's a podcast production company That's and hilarious. like What's a producer? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, by the way, I've still never been able to answer what's a producer. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I don't know. Somebody <laughs> who helps get shit made. Yeah. I, and then there's know. the executive and the not executive. And then, uh, yeah. Totally. Totally. So, no, I mean, look, my lifestyle helps. And certainly the thing that helps the most, I understand myself apart from my job best when I'm in the woods or on the water kayaking or like when I am embedded in a natural wild space, I'm like, oh, right, right. This is this is something real and tangible and that feels so um, good being in nature. Yeah. It's healing. Very. And I would imagine I'd love to hear more about your lifestyle and what you do to deregulate stress or how you cope with stress. 
but also from an acting point of view or from what I've heard so much, whether it's direct any form of entertainment, you know, you need to be, in, people say you need to be in the city because you need to network and do all of this stuff, but mm-hmm. you don't let that impact you. You're living the life that you want to live. And to me, that's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, and listen, it definitely costs me. Yep. It definitely costs me. There are meetings that I don't take and parties I don't go to and things like that. Um, and I had a friend get really real with me at one point, And he was like, if, that, if, if there's a certain kind of career you want, then you have to move to L.A. And I was like, right, but I hate me in L.A. I'm not a good person. I find it very difficult to try and render authentic human behavior as an actor or even as a director when I'm surrounded by people in L.A. because I, I just don't, I don't oh. understand it. I, well, I mean, literally when you're having a conversation with someone and the facial muscles that convey the human emotions that we have evolved over millions of years to understand when those muscles are frozen by plastic surgery and interventions, I literally don't know what someone is saying to me. I'm like, your face is saying one thing and your voice is saying another. And all I'm seeing is a lie and I'm confused. I'm not, I'm really not good in those situations. Um, but I will say I am my, like, I'm writing more and more and I am my best creative self when I am able to go outside and talk to some trees and like, you know, take a paddle on the lake and see some ducks and stuff. I'm just a better creative person. The decision that I made when I was first in LA for like a year and a half, I didn't know anybody who loved it there. And people were sort of living for these vacations and the times that they could go someplace else. And I grew up in Hawaii. And so I know what it's like to live in a place with land and an ocean that feeds me and that feels like family to me. And I thought, how about I live on vacation and travel for work instead of live for work and travel for vacation? And a big part of that was having kids just being like, I'm, I want to raise my kids someplace where they know the land too. Okay. I love this. And it, what I've learned on this podcast is about the shoulds disease and mm-hmm. it kind of mm-hmm. springs to, I bring this up all the time, but I think it's worthy of being brought up again. I had this lady on the podcast. Um, she's a best selling international author, Bronnie Ware, and she wrote a book called the top five regrets of the dying. And to me, it's similar. Mm. She um, interviewed, she was a palliative care nurse and she would interview God, I want to read that book. It, it, it's, a, it's a game changer. And I feel you're embodying top it, but it's a, the okay. the top sorry, five. Sorry, I'm writing this down. No, 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 no. We have a no sorry rule. And oh, so I'm not sorry. The top five regrets of the dying. It should be, yeah, it's right next to me. The top five regrets of the dying by Bronnie Ware. And The number one regret, just to simplify it, was I wish I'd lived the life that I'd wanted to live, that I wanted to live, and not the life that I thought others wanted me to live. And that goes into so many different areas of life, but just we'll we'll simplify it in a sense. As an actor, there's a lot of fear. We've talked about certain belief systems and being told you need to be in a certain place, understanding Mm -hmm. that it might impact your career, but knowing you are better as a creative person with your family, your kids. Mm -hmm to make that decision can be terrifying. Yes. But you know in your heart what is right for you. And not all of us have the courage. In fact, I challenge that everyone at some degree doesn't abide by those principles because we do want to yeah. conform or we all come from fear. But making yeah. a very big decision like that, it might not feel like a big one anymore. I feel- Oh, no, would- it does. <laughs> <laughs> but, it still in does. Ter- but in terms of like the power to know that you've made that decision for your highest good, to me, that that carries, that stays with you. It can't not well, go away, regardless of what you decide. And I have to give credit where credit is due because I met my husband in 1997. We met in university. Oh, wow. And so, and, you know, look, you're married long enough. There are, <laughs> there are things that are easy and there are things that are hard. Yep. But four days after I met my husband, I felt like I'd found my other leg, like, there was just a, oh, okay, you're, you're intrinsic to who I am and I'm intrinsic to who you are. I, we're probably codependent. But, but making that kind of a choice 
when you've got your best friend and the person who has your back and who believes in you going, no, 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 we're going to do this. We're going to do this together. If it doesn't work, we'll leave. But let's take a swing on the life we want before we settle for the life we have to lead. I really think it's much easier, whether it's a partner or a best friend or a parent or a sibling, it's very hard, I think, to do that isolated. I don't think we're meant to be isolated as people. I think to have someone in your community, you know, I mean, two of my friends out here, they moved out here together from Toronto, build this life together. They, their kids have grown up together. Like they, they made a decision together. Um, it's not a romantic relationship. It's just they're, they are each other's person. And this, the courage to make some of the hardest decisions in my life has come from knowing I've got somebody who's got my back in a real way. That's so great. Congratulations. Hey, yeah, man. And it's nice that you can have those conversations of if it doesn't work out, you know, we can make changes. Sometimes when we make mm -hmm. a decision, we think it has to be final, but that's not always the case. So I'm glad can you bring I, that up. Can I share with you the best advice ever I, that I ever got? And I, it wasn't to me, but it was a Shel Silverstein poem. Do you know this poem? No. Um, Shel Silverstein is an amazing children's author. This was a book of poems that like everyone in my generation, at least I think, uh, in the US growing up at the time read. And there's this wonderful poem that goes, listen to the shouldn'ts child, listen to the won'ts, listen, mm, I'm gonna get this wrong. Listen to the shouldn'ts child, listen to the won'ts, listens to the impossibles, the never haves, the don'ts. Listen to the something else, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child, anything can be. And it, it created, I mean, I probably my, think my grandmother read that to me when I was like four. And it made such an impression because what it said was your whole life, people will tell you what you can't do, who you can't be, where you can't go, and what you're not capable of. Now, take a deep breath and realize that none of that matters. None of that belongs to you. Wow. This is amazing to me. You know, I used to, this is what springs to mind. I was very fortunate that after my accounting um, career, if I even want to call that, I went to study kinesiology and Ooh. they talked about the shoulds and the shouldn'ts and all of that stuff. But I was very fortunate at the time. I didn't think it for the first week because I was um, immature in that sense. I was a come from like uni and I was with the boys and working as an accountant. And then I come into this environment where most of the ladies, I'm probably in my mid twenties at that stage, are probably mothers and they're telling me a similar poem to you. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me was studying with these ladies for two and a half years. And it completely changed my mindset of what it is to, you know, live your best life. And, you know, you talked about the shouldn'ts and the shouldn'ts of what actually it means to be, sorry, what it actually means to live your best life and pull all of that to the side. So that was a great little, so many things. Oh, cool. To yeah. Kinesiology is amazing, by the way. Ah. What a cool thing to study. Thank you. It, um, I've done a, I've done a few things and now on the screenwriting and podcast, but kinesiology, I apply, even when I do this, I still apply some principles. Oh, and... that's amazing. Yes. Thank you. Hi, it's me, Michael here. While you're here, the best way to grow and develop a podcast is through word of mouth. If you like this episode, please tell your mates or share it around. Lastly, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any other awesome episodes. Otherwise, let's get back into it. There's one. Th oh, actually, I want to tie this up before we talk about the Prison Break podcast. Yes. I know we spoke about potentially demotivation issues, and I think this is quite interesting because mm. you always hear, I'm going to preface the question with something. You always hear horror stories of potentially managers and agents, but this one actually worked in your favor. I don't know where you're at, but I think you were considering leaving acting. You may have taken a hiatus and a manager who wasn't your manager at the time called you up and said, give me six months and I'll, I'm paraphrasing and I'll make you love acting or the industry again. Can you tell me where you were and how that came to be? Yeah. Um, I had, if I'm remembering right, it was maybe a year after Walking Dead. Um, and I'd had this really wonderful experience of working with this community of people and 
really feeling so creatively excited and so deeply grateful to be a part of it. And then leaving the show was just this absolutely disgusting morass of greed and betrayal. And I just thought, I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to see something so beautiful erode into something so commercial. And I know that's naive, but it's really how I felt. And I was looking at the scripts that were out there and everything felt derivative and uh, uninspiring. And um, I just wasn't sure I had the heart or the stomach for it. And I was thinking, you know, I've always sort of thought part of the reason I got a master's was so that I could teach. And I was like, maybe it's time for me to try and find a university and teach acting and, you know, support another generation of artists and, uh, and see where that leads. Um, and there was this manager, Brian Metavoy, who had written me a letter every six months for a few years saying... I want to represent you. I want to represent you. I want to represent you. And I got another one of those letters and I thought, well, if I'm going to leave the business, I should probably at least give this a shot. Um, and he was so in love with movies and television, just like a true believer. His father, Mike Metavoy, has like, I don't know, a dozen Oscars or something. Like he produced Apocalypse Now and A Thin Red Line. And like, he's this incredible producer. And I think one of the things that he passed on to his son is a deep love of what the best of Hollywood can be. How nice. It, it, was, it was astonishing. And Brian was just completely infectious. And I did a little research on him. I, you know, I'd asked a few people about him and everybody said they're like, he's, he's a man of integrity and he's loved and he's trusted and... Um, and six months later, I got, he sent me a script for Colony or a few months later. Oh, and I wow. Said, I that's love the this. timeline. Oh, wild. Yeah. Yeah. I fell in love with it. And they said, we don't want to see you. We don't want to, we don't want anyone from Walking Dead in the show. Why and is that? so I think because it was, Walking Dead was still so huge. They just wanted it to have its separate identity. Um, and so, and that's when Brian kind of worked his magic. He's like, you get yourself, he's, uh, he's like, I'll send you audition sides, I'll find them. You give yourself on tape, and I will get that tape to people who can at least say no to your audition. I can't get you the part, but I can at least get them to watch it. And, you know, that became one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. I love hearing stories like that. We can, we can focus too much, as I said, on the negative agents and the negative managers, and I'm sure you've had oh, that, no. but someone... With integrity, first of all, I love the word integrity. It's my yeah. highest value after everything I've ever had in my life. But someone who could like meet you where you're at and the enthusiasm is contagious. That yeah. is great. I'm glad that you got to meet him and I'm glad it worked both ways because Colony also led you into directing and it's kind of changed Absolutely. your life as well. And those are beautiful yeah. stories to hear. Um, I want to go to your Prison Break podcast. I have a thousand <laughs> questions. You go as deep yes. as you want with them because I know you're going to address them on your podcast. So people okay. will have to hear it. One, mm -hmm. what is it called? And why did you just start? Why did you decide to start it? So it's called Prison Breaking with Sarah and Paul because I'm Sarah and I played Sarah and Paul Edelstein played uh, Paul Kellerman. And I, I was um, going to ask you about why they did that on the show. Uh, and Paul and I have been friends ever since the show. And, you know, Prison Break was both extraordinary in that opened so many doors for me. And there were parts of that show that really hurt me. And for years, I put it in a box. Um, and then Paul reached out to me a few years ago. And he said, would you ever want to do a rewatch podcast of this? And I was like, I, I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know what it would be like to sit down and watch these things. And then I kept thinking about it and I thought, I don't even think I would recognize, I don't feel like her anymore, that person. I think I could watch it from a third person perspective. Um, and as I've moved more into directing and producing and other things in my life, 
I've had a better sense of what enormous gifts that job gave me. I mean, that the impact that show had around the world oh. has allowed me to connect with people in the refugee space, people in the tech space, people in the finance space who only know me as the girl from Prison Break. Um, and so I'm super grateful. And it's like, well, let's let's go back in and let's do a bunch of stuff with, you know, we do a lot of fan stuff. We've got like fan contests and we answer fan questions. And, you know, we're really, because that was a huge part of the experience for us, All right? It was kind of the beginning of that kind of fan culture where, you know, there were online chat rooms and people responding almost in real time to like, I just watched this live and now I'm going to write about it or write fan fiction. And so, and then, you know, and then after I did this scripted show called Aftershock that I wrote and directed and produced and cast and stuff, and I fell in love with the podcast space. So when we, my producing partner, Ben Haber, and I just started, decided to start Caliber Studio, which is a, a podcast production company, I called Paul back and I was like, all right, let's, let's do this. I have 10,000 questions. One, a huge shout out to Paul, <laughs> who's been on the podcast. I and know. He loved you, by the way. He was like, oh, he's I such a he, lovely guy. Uh, he, okay. And, okay. I'll say this. I got a screenplay offer and um, luckily it didn't work out. And I just had a feeling that he would be a great person to ask. And he, we were actually emailing him with um, contract stuff. Didn't work out, which is great, but it was so nice that he even looked at the email. And I was very grateful wow. for that. He didn't need oh, that's to do incredible. that. No, he's a deeply, deeply generous person. Oh, and, and we, we kept in contact for a bit and we were giving each other like meditation practices and stuff like that. There's a, f a few other Ooh. things. He is what a, what a mensch. I never used that word. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and also great combo between the two of you, your, your energies together. We, I've listened to the first episode. It's great. And also Thanks. to the prison break people, I've had all on, I've had William Fickner or you might call him Bill. Oh yeah. And my God, still to this day, I get people from Prison Break keep on messaging me about those podcasts. It's the craziest fans in, the, in a positive way. They're so wonderful. And it's crazy that it's still going on now. And also, even from a non-prison, because um, my partner was listening to the episode with me, she's never seen Prison Break. But it's such yeah. a good idea to just understand, one, there's a bit about the TV landscape where, you know, you guys are talking about like mentally what happened, interesting facts you don't need to necessarily like Prison Break. It's really interesting to go back into that time and hear it from two actors who are very prominent in that role. I, I think it's a really oh, unique cool. and great concept. Well, we try and sort of talk about what it meant to do television in 2005. Mm. And, and also because we both direct and we both write, we're talking about the business of making, making stories. And so I, my hope is people who've never watched the show can still listen and really kind of geek out with us on, oh my God, you guys, we shot this on film. And one day it was 28 below zero in Chicago and the film kept snapping. So we had to wrap like that'll be interesting. And then for the hardcore fans, we do this thing called the watch party and it's, it's behind a pay paywall. It's on Patreon, but like we sync up our, our gear and everything and then we hit play on the show and we record our reactions to the show. It's basically a reaction video. It's, it's such a good idea. And so you at home, you hit play on the podcast episode and play on the show at the same time. And it's a little bit like Mystery Science Theater 3000, right? It's just us talking about the show while the show is going on. And that's, that's for the hardcore fans. I think it's very... Let me Interesting, even just from a creative perspective, my girlfriend who's not in it, I think it's great. I'm sure you'll discuss this on your podcast, but what was it like coming back? I know that we can talk about this for a whole long time, but mm -hmm. what was it like coming back? And I think you've come back twice. You don't normally come back even once, but you've come back kind of, well. <laughs> um, really interesting. Really interesting. I mean, coming back the first time, was so bizarre because when I was killed off the show, 
you know, I never had a chance to say goodbye to anybody because it happened during the hiatus. And may I add, it was a travesty that you were cut off. I want to, I want that <laughs> on the record, but continue. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and someday on the podcast, when we get to those, you know, when we get to that, I'll tell that story for the first time. But um, coming back for season four was kind of crazy because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit weird, right? It's It's like dating the boyfriend who broke up with you again. It was a little strange, but I was also a totally different person. I was like, I just had a kid. And so there is now a priority rearrangement in my life where a lot of things that maybe would have bugged me. I just, I don't care, man. I just, let's tell a great story. I like that wisdom. Um, let's let go of the other stuff. Season five was crazy because That's when again, I brought it, yeah, brought it back. Yeah. Home. That was the yeah. kind of reboot situation because again, we'd all said goodbye to it. And also, you know, in that time, especially Dom and Went had changed so much, right? Like Wentworth had come out originally, you know, when we shot the show, I was the only one that he was out to, which oh, created, wow. yeah, it created a, a dynamic that was in some ways beautiful and intimate. And in some ways, as I look back on it, really hard um, because I lied to everyone. You know, he told me, he's like, I'm not out and I don't want to be out. And so people would ask me point blank, which of course isn't really appropriate, but whatever. You're like, not everybody knew that. And so I would honor his wishes and I would lie to them. I'd be like, no, he's not gay. And I don't like that. <laughs> you know, so like it created a dynamic that I wasn't a big fan of. Yeah. Especially people who then found out I was lying and was like, why did you lie to me? And I was like, because it's not my story to tell. But, yeah. um, but you know, so Wentworth was out. He'd been very public about some of his uh, uh, mental health journeys. So had Dominic. And there was a bit of a full circle aspect of it, of kind of going, you know, more humility had kind of filtered into the equation. I was also coming off of Walking Dead. And so instead of showing up on set as somebody oh. who had never done anything before, I was showing up having just, you know, for a couple of years, been the leading lady of the number one show in the world. And it was like, well, I don't wear that. I don't carry that. But I could see that other people ascribed it. Do you know what I mean? Just oh, a status thing. Yeah, not, in a, not in a shitty no, way. No, but, no, just but like, it sounds like you, would have, you wouldn't have cared, but someone else was projecting no. there. Yeah, yeah. No, because everything is momentary. Like our perceived momentary status in the business is completely ephemeral. And I've seen people reach very high heights and then vanish. And I've seen people do extraordinary work for 20 years with no um, acknowledgement. You know, like your IMDB pro score is a meaningless algorithm, silly thing that I think sometimes people, or your call sheet number, like I just none of that matters. But for some people who haven't quite observed the meaninglessness of it, <laughs> they can that. give it a certain amount of credit. And it's like, okay, well, you know. Awesome. Hey, if, you, if you're being nice to me, be nice to me. Great. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> I love that. And um, people can check it out in the episode notes below. We, I think you're on all the major podcast platforms, at least Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Yeah, we are. I'll be in the episode the notes below. What we're going to do now to wrap up the podcast is to do a quick rapid fire segment. So the first Ooh. thing that springs to mind, and I yes. will not comment on them because I derail them every time. Okay. Ready to rumble? I'm excited. What's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Kindness. Do you have a philosophy on life that you follow? Don't be a dick. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Eat. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve? Duplicity. If you could gain any skill in the world, which one would it be? Flying. Does like that count? Is that a real, is that a real skill? <laughs> is that a superpower? Yeah, um, if it was a real world skill, I would want perfect eyesight for the rest of my life. Very interesting. I know I said I wouldn't comment. Uh, what are you most proud of? My children. Biggest regret? Every time I told myself I wasn't worth shit. 
And what have you done to feel better with that negative self-talk? I feel like you've got a lot of tools and you've got Nature. a practice. Yes. Nature. Do you have a and practice? Meditation. Oh, how long have you yeah. been doing uh, since I started directing, <laughs> since <laughs> that first timing. episode where I thought, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. A friend of mine was like, you need to meditate or you're going to explode. And I was like, oh, you're right. That really helps. I feel like Paul should take you through a meditation in one of the watch parties. Like if you're like Ooh. stressed by a scene and he would be very good because I know he's into that stuff. As no, well. I'm learning about this from you. So then we're recording an episode tomorrow. I will bring up meditation with him. Oh, you can. I, I know his whole life. So you've got any questions to spring <laughs> up on him. I was actually going to, this is just a side point. Sorry for taking away. What is the etiquette? I was thinking of messaging him to say, is there anything I need to know about Sarah? Or is that weird or creepy? I wasn't sure. So I did. I did. I was <laughs> like, I'm doing the, I'm doing the funny and failure podcast. Is there anything I need to know? That's fair. And enough. he just goes, lovely guy. That was 100% of his response. Oh, okay. That, that means a lot. Thank you, Paul. You're also a lovely guy. Okay. <laughs> now, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Wow. What would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? Write a novel. Is that on the works? Anything that no. you would? No. <laughs> I feel like you could. You no, know, it's you... not. <laughs> well, that's going to be your homework for next time. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm now going to do some of the fan questions very quickly. Oh, yeah. um, what did you learn from the Celestine prophecy? Oh. If anything springs to mind. I know it was a while ago. That sometimes people aren't who they say they are. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Tell me how you got involved in IRC and what it is. IRC stands for International Rescue Committee. Uh, it's one of the largest refugee aid organizations in the world. Um, it was founded in 1933 at the behest of Albert Einstein to get uh, the Jews and other vulnerable people out of occupied France. I got involved with them because I'd been a donor. Um, not a whole lot, but... Uh, when they decided they wanted to start having spokespeople, they looked at their donor list. And so I was actually the first person that they ever came to. Um, oh. And I became a donor because my grandfather was a refugee. Uh, he came to New York when he was eight and he fell flat on his face and there was no support. And so the idea of supporting an organization that could help people with the transition and um, felt like the right way to give back. That is awesome. What is one thing that Andy Lincoln, John, I can't say their surnames, I'm embarrassed, John Bernthal and Josh Holloway taught you that you hold on to or that spring to mind? Um, John taught me that nothing is more important as an actor than the truth. Josh told, taught me that you can win any argument by smothering people in love. Oh, it's extraordinary to like, he just, he's just like a love bomb and you're like, all right, you win. Um, and Andy taught me that unfailing grace is a foolproof form of leadership. That's pretty profound. And of the characters, not them, which would make the best partner or husband in real life. Of the characters? Of the characters that you played with them. God. I don't know. I think possibly Will, actually, um, from Colony. Because, I mean, Shane's a bit of a loose cannon. Uh, Rick might be a little too in his feelings. Um, I love that. <laughs> and, yeah, I will. Yeah, I just, I loved Will. I mean, I love them all, but, like, I don't know. Will for whatever reason today. I'd probably have a different answer tomorrow. That's true. Last two questions. Um, mm. Any advice you want to give to people who want to try something different on you, but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so? We all make total fools of ourselves all the time. So it's okay because you're not alone. You're going to, failure is a part of the process. I was actually just the other day uh, going over something with my 16-year-old Um and I found myself saying, I was like, the bad first draft is a universal truth of writing. So if you write a first draft 
and it needs to be totally changed, you are on the right track. You are like doing what Hemingway did. It's fine. Take a deep breath. Failure is a part of failure is a part of everything. It's as integral to success as knowing what the fuck you're doing. We're going to get you as a co-host. <laughs> I love that. That's what I needed to hear. Also from the writing side. Before we go, how can people follow you, keep up to date with you? I know you, we spoke about the Prison Break podcast. You also have Aftershock and anything else that you want to talk about. Uh, yeah, I'm mostly on Instagram. It's my name. at Sarah Wayne Callies. Um, that's that's pretty much it. I'll be directing some stuff. You can watch that. Uh, Anyone you want to name so people can. Well, I'm, I'm directing another episode of Fire Country. Um, I'm supposed to be directing an episode of The Irrational, which is a show on NBC this season, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's the first time directing for NBC for me and the first time on that show, which is very cool. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to move into this podcast world. I'm not um, trying you have. You've already... <laughs> I am moving into this podcast world and loving the creative freedom and loving, honestly, loving the opportunity to sort of connect with people like you two, who I think are doing something really meaningful and really beautiful. And thank you for having me here. Well, thank you. You are amazing. I love your mindset. Thank you for bringing up everything you've, you've done. A few words that spring to mind is the wisdom, the grace and the compassion, which I think we all need to, and integrity, my favorite word. This was amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll have to do it again. And yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Outstanding. I love Sarah's quote, if you want a better world, tell better stories. Stories have an important role in both how we see the world and ourselves. Storytelling is one of the pillars of building a meaningful life because stories are, at heart, about meaning and connection. Stories are essential to human cognition and communication. We engage with others through stories and storytelling is a lot more than just a recitation of facts and events. As human beings, we are automatically drawn to stories because we see ourselves reflected in them and this can help shift our perspective of what is possible to achieve as well as areas to grow and learn from. This awareness allows Sarah to shine a light on the world and create a more meaningful, thought-provoking experience for all. So I'll leave you with this amazing quote. People forget facts, but they remember stories. Joseph Campbell Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 